Welcome to the Westminster Effects Doxology Podcast, where we exist for the glory of God and the tone of His people. I'm Cody Fields, the president of Westminster Effects. Go buy stuff for your guitar at westminstereffects.com and join the discussion at the Westminster Effects Doxology Podcast Lounge on Facebook. You know the drill. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Give us five stars, blah, 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 blah. I'm joined in person by... Bradley Cox, pastor at Resurrection Church in Greer, South Carolina. So a few weeks ago, I don't even know how long ago it was at this point, uh, but we we talked about the American Gospel Roundtable discussion right? between uh, Sam Storms and Michael Brown on the continuationist side, and we had some issues with them, mm-hmm. and then Sam Osman and Justin Peters, was it Sam Os- Jim Osman? Jim Osman. And, and Justin Peters on the other side. Uh, them being cessationists, and we had some issues with them. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, So we figured it would be good to kind of do a little series of, one, what's spiritual giftedness anyway, Uh, and maybe let's drill down on some definitions, even if we might disagree on a couple of those. Uh, See if we throw... You've been wrong before. Yeah, you have to. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, See if we, uh, see if an elder and a deacon in the same church can throw a punch on video and mm -hmm. stay in our offices and... (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yep, <laughs> stuff yep. like that. So, uh, one, let's just get a quick working definition of spiritual giftedness for those who haven't been around the Doxology podcast and where we kind of land as, I guess you could call reformed continuationists. Yeah. Um, so this is, you mentioned that we had some, you know, issues with both the continuations continuationist guys and the cessationist guys. Right. Um, one of my main issues with the continuationist guys is the, the way in which they talked about spiritual gifts, Yeah, which I don't think entirely lines up with what I see in scripture. Right. You know, first Corinthians chapter 12, verse seven, where Paul talks about spiritual gifts, he, he says it this way to each is given a manifestation of the spirit Mm -hmm. for the common good. Right. So that says to me, that's a, that's a clear definition of a spiritual gift. Mm -hmm. What is a spiritual gift? It is a manifestation of the spirit. It is not this magic fairy dust that the spirit (laughs) sprinkles on certain people. And he has this variety of different types of dust, which we (laughs) then, you know, you know, that that we call an anointing that just stays there forever because he said so. Exactly. As if he puts something in our hand or in our souls that we get to wield however, and whenever we want. Right. Uh, so for example, if we, I think all, everybody cessationist and continuationist alike would agree that the spiritual gift of teaching is still functioning in yes. the life of the church. So what is the spiritual gift of, of teaching? Well, it's not just pedagogical competency. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we pe- do like big words around here. We, we do pedagogical competency, meaning the ability to teach, mm-hmm. Uh, I have an ability to teach, a natural ability. I mm-hmm. can, you know, process information and then communicate it in such a way that it's understandable. You you probably have that ability mm-hmm. as well. We know many others. There are teachers in the public school system, at universities right. that have natural gifts to teach. That doesn't mean they have the spiritual gift of teaching. Right. There is even a sense, you know, if you look at Colossians chapter 3, um, I forget which verse, but it Teach and admonish one another. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. Right. So there is a spirit-empowered, spirit-led kind of teaching that happens with every believer mm-hmm. within the body of Christ. That doesn't mean that all are called to be pastors. Uh, right. But that does mean that as a believer, I, 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 my expectation should be that I would come to know the truth of God's word to the degree that I'm able to not only be taught, but also teach others. Yes. that's We still haven't got to what I believe is the essence of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 12. Yes. It, we might say it this way. Naturally speaking, there is a baseline ability to teach mm-hmm. that some people have. Mm-hmm. Spiritually speaking... There is a baseline spirit empowered um, ability to teach and admonish one another. Right. That all Christians 
and dwelt by the Spirit have. But then I believe there is an above the baseline manifestation of the Spirit. He, God the Holy Spirit, is making himself known through people in teaching Mm -hmm. in a supernatural way. There's a supernatural edge on a person who is communicating a, the truth of God's word that is actually a manifestation of the spirit. And here's the interesting thing about a spiritual gift is it doesn't always line up with natural abilities. Right. Apparently, the apostle Paul was not an impressive communicator. Mm-hmm. Apollos was, there seem to be clues and hints mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. Apollos mm-hmm. was really good at getting up in front of people and talking. And I believe he had a spiritual right. gift to teach. Right. But Paul obviously had a spiritual gift of teaching at work in him, yep. or there was a manifestation of the Spirit in and through Paul's teaching that was unique and above the baseline, even though he didn't, naturally speaking, apparently have impressive communication skills or impressive presence in front of people. So right. all that to say this, you know, Sam Storms talked about the gift of healing in that video Mm -hmm. as though it was this, what's the right way to describe it? Magic fairy dust or a supernatural ability that is, you know, given to a person to wield any time and every time they want. That that seems to be the way he talked about it. Mm -hmm. That's why he, he started to describe, and rightfully so, Paul's plural language when he says gifts, plural, of healings, plural, right. uh, as though there maybe is not this people within the body of Christ who have who, who should get a, a badge that says, I have the gift of healing. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and that's honestly... And, and, and let me finish the thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, and, and the reason I take issue with that is because I don't treat gifts as ends unto themselves. Exactly. They are manifestations of the Spirit. Now, could it be that in the same way the Spirit regularly and habitually makes himself known through me in teaching, that he might in some kind of regular and habitual way make himself known through someone with gifts of healings? Mm -hmm. I'm not inclined to say no to that. Right. Because... I see gifts as manifestations of the spirit. Mm-hmm. So and 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 he uh the spirit gives those sovereignly. Sovereignly as he wills. And right. it, and it, it it could even be uh like you talked about me being able to teach and stuff. And there's there's I think there's some level of spiritual giftedness with teaching because I'm a small group leader. Like some of that's been recognized. I, and I would say I see the gift of teaching. Sure. I sure. see it operating. Um at the same time, there are times when I think the Spirit has humbled me <laughs> in, and me in too. those situations, right? Yeah. Where, I had to pee one time in the middle of a sermon. <laughs> and I hate that I missed that. <laughs> you were here that day? I, 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 was, uh, I was in the first service, and I didn't play guitar that day, and I completely missed the whole thing. I literally had to call a timeout <laughs> in the middle of the sermon because I just got to talking to people. It was the second service. <laughs> I got to talking to people, but you know, between services and, and didn't make the now habitual stop by the restroom the, before the PWP. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but like there's, there's no, been... there's no video for you to find of that. So <laughs> because, don't even look. because we post the first service. <laughs> <laughs> I did hear that, uh, Ethan, our connections and youth minister, like sprinted to the sound booth, said, "Mute his microphone." <laughs> he did. He did. <laughs> uh, but there, there have been times when after, after our small group Bible study that I lead, uh, like I've gotten in the car and, man, I stepped in it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and so, like, it, it is a dependence. And even if you are depending, God might might still humble you in that situation, right? So Absolutely. it's not it's not turning on a switch or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, but it does seem, and you could probably speak to this a little more, being uh, having a more Pentecostal charismatic background. It seems that Pentecostals and Charismatics tend to, not speaking for all of them, tend to treat it as flipping a switch or that magical fairy dust or whatever. And yes, I have this gift of teaching or this gift of healing or this gift of 
X, Y, Z, and they they tend to gravitate toward the more flamboyant ones, I guess you could yeah. say, the, the more uh, exuberant ones of tongues, which we'll get into, prophecy, stuff like that, where it's it, it basically is them ginning that it up in themselves because it's this indelible mark that God's put on them. Yeah, and, you know, and, and they wear them like, you know, badges of honor. Right. And um, not to say that there isn't some honor and recognition that could be rightfully given to a person who, uh, you know, for example, operates in the gift of teaching and, and, and because of that gift steps into a, a place of spiritual authority. And we just mm-hmm. came out of a Bible study in first Thessalonians five, where Paul says, esteem those who are highly esteem those who are over you in the Lord. There is a right sense of honor that can be given to people when you recognize the spirit works through you in these right. ways. Right. And, I want to I want to honor and praise God for that work in and through you, but you know when people go around calling themselves prophets, so and so, we we got a, another issue altogether at that point. There's a yeah, and and minimally the issue is you've made the gift about you rather than about the person of the Holy Spirit because a spiritual gift is a manifestation of Him, not a manifestation mm-hmm. of me. Yeah, so I know <laughs> before we hit record, we talked about uh, doing an episode on tongues, but I think that's a really good segue to talk about the gift of prophecy. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe let's just spend the rest of the time on that. Sure. And, and you also just talked about that gift in in the uh, in the small group or in that midweek Bible study that we do every other week. Mm-hmm. Um, what is the gift of prophecy? And just to work like you have this document that our boy Brian Onkin has created. Uh, but I think, I think one of the big issues with prophecy and how it's understood is that it's not understood. Right. <laughs> right. Put it that way. I, I think this is Brian's definition. Um, you know, these words aren't necessarily inspired, but I think we, we could make a strong case. Mm-hmm. These are biblically rooted right. words. Uh, Prophecy is when the Spirit, the person of God, the Holy Spirit, provides insight into the mind and heart of God. Yes. It's not just future telling Mm -hmm. um, or or even, you know, being able to identify details and um, facts about someone or a situation that you would not know, naturally Mm -hmm. speaking. That might even be more in in line with what Paul calls a word of knowledge. Which there's – what's funny is – um, Charles Spurgeon was a cessationist mm-hmm. and, and a classic cessationist in that he thought that certain gifts weren't operational at that point in time, right? And in the 1800s, like there were times when he would, in the middle of a sermon, be like, You stole from your boss. <laughs> and he had no idea who that guy was. No, no, I mean, there was a prophetic edge to Charles Spurgeon that, yeah, who was a card carrying cessationist that. No one would deny, right? You you would have to deny history to 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 see that or to to say that that wasn't true of him. Yeah, um, I think prophetic words are my insight into the mind and heart of God that the Spirit would would give. And and I I personally do not think that there does Paul say in Ephesians that Jesus gave gifts to the church in you know evangelists apostles. Prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. Yes, he does say that, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but he didn't. He didn't say that under inspiration of the Spirit, so that we could have, you know, clarity about what titles we're supposed to give who. Right, right. That's that's not the point. Right. The point is to, you know, and I think spiritual gifts tests, which I, I imagine most of our listeners would have some familiarity mm-hmm. with that. I think those things have been a, a detriment. Yes, to us in this regard because. Nowhere in Scripture am I led to conclude that I'm to self-identify when it comes to spiritual gifts. It's recognized by the church. It's recognized by yep. the church. I I was recognized by the church as having a gift of teaching. You right. as well. Mm-hmm. That's why you're leading a small group, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And and now here's where it gets a little uncomfortable for the cessationist. Um, I say a little uncomfortable they probably would dismiss what I'm about to say altogether. Well, me being a squishy continuationist, I might get uncomfortable too. So I I think that there is something to be said for recognizing in people, not something to be said. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to be direct. I think that there should be an awareness in the body of Christ of those whom 
the Spirit regularly and habitually makes himself known to the gift of prophecy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If it's a gift, then... Insight yeah. into the mind and heart of God. And 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 now, I know where everybody's mind goes. We, they go to all the abuses. Yep. But we just went over this. First Thessalonians. While, while you're turning, yep. let's, let's talk about the abuses real quick. Okay. Uh, so you have... For instance, Remnant Radio. Are you familiar with those guys at all? Yeah. Uh, so charismatic guys, uh, mm-hmm. we would count them as brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just think they're wrong on some stuff. Um, and them being charismatics, they, I actually applaud this. Mm-hmm. They they took every 2023 quote-unquote prophecy on YouTube that they could find and said, did that happen? Mm-hmm. And the answer on nearly all of them, and I, I think actually all – Every single one of them was no. Okay. It was false prophecy. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do you do with the fact that, uh, and I, I'm saying this as a continuationist, you know, so I'm not denying this gift, the fact that all of those were wrong, and then even just last five years, no one predicted COVID, no one predicted Israel Hamas, no one predicted X, Y, Z, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you you literally have zero record of anybody predicting those things when these people claim that God is speaking to them directly all the time. How do you answer that kind of question? Well, I mean, when, when it comes to like, you know, global events and, and, and things like that, I mean, I, I, I would not say that God wouldn't right. give insight to someone that the spirit wouldn't want to give insight uh, to someone with regard to those things before they happen. But Hey, I don't think prophecy is just predicting the future. Right. Uh, It might include that. Mm -hmm. um, But I don't think that's, it certainly included that in the old Testament. Yes. Uh, In in the, in the new Testament, we see like, um, you know, the, the women that prophesied over Paul, you know, Mm -hmm. and there was prophetic insight that was given about, his final trip to Jerusalem. Um, right. So it could include that. Um, but I don't think that that's all that it includes. I think, mm-hmm. I think prophetic insight could be, I, I ask, and I, I got this from Piper, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm following those who follow Christ. Um, Piper says he prays before every sermon that he would have, that the spirit would operate in the gift of teaching and in prophecy. Mm-hmm. That what he says would be prophetic in the sense that it is congruent with the mind and heart of God for right. his people. So I, I pray the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I tell people this, I feel like a lot of times when I'm praying for people, I think there's a gift, a prophetic gift that works in and through my praying. Right. Not necessarily saying, hey, this is what's going to happen when I'm praying, but just, I can just sense the mind and heart of God being present in my prayers, which I believe are spirit led and the spirit right. making himself known in that way. So that'd be one answer. The other answer is, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of evil mm-hmm. and, yeah. and this is absolutely, th- this is what Paul says. First Thessalonians five, great segue. <laughs> uh, first Thessalonians five, verse 16, beginning in verse 16, rejoice always pray without ceasing in everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus do not quench the spirit and this is an instruction that is not given to apostles right this is given to a local church in yep. Thessalonica that Paul had only been with for about 2 weeks before he was run out of town mm-hmm. don't quench the spirit and then next verse do not despise prophetic utterances do, mm-hmm. don't treat them with contempt don't ignore them. So, okay, it, if, if someone says, I have a prophetic word, it would be disobedient to treat that with contempt immediately or ignore it. Mm-hmm. That would be mm-hmm. unbiblical. Right. Is that fair? Yes. So to my cessationist friends, <laughs> right. if you, it, just because someone says, I have a prophetic word from the Lord, or, or they speak in a prophetic way, if you immediately dismiss that or ignore that, I, I see that as incongruent with mm-hmm. Paul's instruction. You have here. to get to the next verse in order to dismiss anything. Next verse. Examine everything carefully, which obviously, I don't think I have to explain this, but obviously examining it carefully would have to include 
does it line up with the inspired, written, infallible Word of God? Right. You right. know, if if God is saying, or if someone is claiming that God is saying, uh, I got a word from God. He is going to save everyone on the planet. Like basically advocating universalism. No, exactly. <laughs> or we okay. have a we, ha- stop. Right. we have a solar eclipse yesterday, and there. are yahoos out there claiming that the rapture was going to happen mm-hmm. now we could talk about the rapture but let's just say that <laughs> someone says i have a prophetic word this solar eclipse that happened yesterday is going to coincide with the second coming of christ mm-hmm. all right it would be wrong for me to immediately dismiss that mm-hmm. what would be right is for me to test it right test it with the word of god and what did jesus say it's not for you to know Mm-hmm. times or seasons mm-hmm. that the father mm-hmm. has determined mm-hmm. according to his own will. It's not for me to know. Right. So someone who claims to know that is not something I'm going to hold fast to instead. It's still a very quick dismissal, but it's not an immediate dismissal. It's not an immediate dismissal. Examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. So the guys that were prophesying the rapture or the second coming of Christ with the solar eclipse yesterday, that I'm not saying that all of those people are in and of themselves evil, but that word is evil because right. it's not in line with the mind and heart of God. And that's clear. We can, you know, clearly test that against God's word. Right. So, ah, oh man, where was I going to go with that? Because uh, I had a thought before you segued mm-hmm. and then I lost it. What was your first point that you were going after? We can't despise prophetic utterances. Right. Um, and, and I think that you know, with all of those, you know, these guys from remnant radio that looked at all these prophecies in 2023 and not one of them came true. Um, that is one way to test a prophecy also is, is right. it true? Did it, right. did it, if someone's claiming a prophetic word that predicts something in the future, does it happen? Mm-hmm. If it doesn't, that's a pretty simple yeah, I'm not going to I'm going to abstain from that evil because it's not it, it it it's not true. Right. So, I think I think also Deuteronomy 18 is really important for this conversation as well. Um for those of you watching, this is my LSB goat skin. This is my first ever like Cadillac Bible mm-hmm. and it feels so nice. Mm-hmm. Uh I also really like the LSB in that it translates L O R D all caps Yahweh as Yahweh. I love that. Um and the pages feel nice. <laughs> but in Deuteronomy 18, uh, let's see, where am I looking for? <laughs> and it will... Do, 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 what verse? It, uh, I'm trying to find which verse I want to start at. I probably could have just read verse the whole 20? thing by now, probably. Uh, but the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak of, or which he speaks in the name of other gods... That prophet shall die. Mm-hmm. Now, I think obviously we understand if somebody says, "Hey, uh, Allah came to me and said this is going to happen," any good Christian is going to be like, "Okay, whatever. <laughs> We're going to ignore you because you said Allah or Vishnu or mm-hmm. Buddha told you that." Right. Right. Uh, now, you have one. He speaks a word presumptuously. Right. Mm-hmm. He has presumed that God told him something that he didn't. Yep. Right. And then it didn't come true. The penalty for that in Deuteronomy mm-hmm. is death. Mm-hmm. This is how seriously God takes this. Mm-hmm. The new covenant penalty is we don't kill you, <laughs> but, but we, we abstain. But we don't listen to you anymore. And that and and you know, you keep reading. Uh, you may say in your heart, next verse, how will we know the word which Yahweh has not spoken? In verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, if a th- if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not <laughs> spoken. This is a really easy test. Yeah. Let me break it down for you real <laughs> simple. And then the prophet that has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. Right. Don't listen to that guy. Don't listen to him. It's kind of like how we've talked about with uh, Corey Truax, uh, with listening to political commentators or even pastors who like cause your blood pressure to start rising. Just don't pay attention to those guys. Mm-hmm. I think it's the same thing here. Yep. That, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely unregenerate 
or that they're out of the family of God, but don't listen to them. Yep. Yep. You know, I think some of our cessationist friends would, would say, why do we need prophecy? Um, we have God's written, inspired, infallible word. And when, when it comes to those who might prophesy, if we were to, for at least a minute, agree that the Spirit might still want to work through in, in the gift of prophecy, mm-hmm. uh, I think we all have to acknowledge that this is infallible. Mm-hmm. But And anything that the Spirit might say, real time, would also be infallible and would line up perfectly with this. Mm-hmm. But the fallibility comes in with, I'm not a perfect hearer. I think I would push back on that in that um, like you talked about uh, in this Bible study we just did. Let's references to that today. Um, The Holy Spirit is not standing in the corner Mm -hmm. saying, all right, I'll show up when, when you've tried hard enough. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And I think it's the same case with spiritual giftedness, right? Like it's, it's not just doled out when you're ready. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also not, uh, you, you don't have to turn the dial to make sure you're on the same radio frequency. Like Chris, Chris, right. Chris Rosebro has said, you know, the Holy Spirit's not out there saying, hey guys, this is the Holy Spirit. Yep, yep. Can, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Like if God wants to speak through somebody, he will. He if, will. He, if he can speak through a donkey, <laughs> he can speak through a dude. Yeah, and, and, and I, I guess I just experientially know that um, sometimes when I think I've felt prompted or, or, or nudged or think I hear the Lord speaking and, and it doesn't seem later down the road, it becomes more clear to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that my, my hearing at times, just like when I read this, I don't always understand it right Right. the first time. I think that's a helpful clarification too. And especially I've, I've never heard you say, thus saith the Lord. No. X, Y, Z. Right. Like, I, in fact, I, I have purposely dispossessed myself of all that language. Right. Which I was taught, you mm-hmm. know, growing up. Um, if I, and I don't even, I, honestly, I don't even think in terms of like, cat, like categorizing the ways in which the spirit is working. I just mm-hmm. try to depend on the spirit. Right. And sometimes I feel like the spirit works in a way that is prophetic. Mm-hmm. And I pray when, and, and I've said this already, when I pray for people, I feel and sense that the spirit is leading me to pray. And, and the thing is all the time when I sense that, I feel like I'm, I'm being prompted to pray scripture mm-hmm. and, 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 and what, what the scriptures that I pray, um, uh, they are always sort of like just so perfectly timed and, speak to exactly what that person is going through uh, and and aren't taken out of context but are helpful to what the, the situation that this person is facing that I'm praying with. And so I think I just I just try to be mindful of the spirit and let, you know, one of the things I said in this Bible study today too that we keep referencing is that I, I just think a lot of believers are just not very familiar with what the scriptures tell us, the spirit is actively doing all the time in our lives. You know, we did, we did take video of that. Maybe we just need to post the audio of it as a bonus episode. <laughs> because, you know, this, this whole section, you know, from first Thessalonians that I just read, you, you could really, uh, back up to, I mean, really the beginning of chapter five, but particularly chapter five verses 12, uh, to 22, um, I think there's a tremendous amount of helpful content there about the kinds of things that the Spirit is actively doing in mm-hmm. us, and to become more familiar with that is a good thing, right. more sensitive to his ongoing work. Right. I remembered my previous thought that I had lost. Um, we often conflate prophecy with fortune-telling, right, like we've talked about. Oh, yeah. Um, but what you see in Scripture with prophecy if you look at just straight up, here's what's going to happen in the future. That's relatively rare. 
most of the time, because we're talking about manifestations mm-hmm. of the spirit for the mm-hmm. common good. Mm-hmm. So it's it's going to be for the good of the church somehow. Right. So what you see in prophecies is here's what God thinks about what's going on, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's Israel's sin or whatever. And then there's some kind of future event that says, here's how I'm going to prove it effectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I just flopped open to Isaiah 8. Uh, Assyria is going to invade mm-hmm. because of your sin. This is mm-hmm. what God thinks about it. Here's the thing to confirm it. And so what you most often see through Scripture is prophecies about redemptive history. Mm-hmm. You see think the very next chapter, Isaiah 9, mm-hmm. right? You have – I've got to turn the page. Uh, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Mm-hmm. Those who live in the land of the shadow of death, the light will shine on them, shall multiply the nation. And then on down, uh, there will be no end to the increase of his government over, or of peace, right. prophesying about Jesus, right? right? And so, so much of it is actually about redemptive history and what God is going to do through his people. It's not about you're going to go buy a lottery ticket, make sure you scratch off the third, second, and eighth <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> scratch off thing. And yep. then, and then you'll win a billion dollars. Yep. It's not this kind of fortune telling, uh, or even cold reading, or uh, like what Sean Bowles has done, uh, renowned false prophet, where he really just has people scrub people's Facebook pages, yeah. <laughs> and then reads notes. Yeah. Right. It's it's never anything like that. It's always for the common good. Yep. 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 And um, I, I I I'm a I'm a Bible guy. That sounds kind of weird to say, but I, <laughs> uh, shouldn't all Christians be Bible people? Yes, absolutely. I think um, you know we're we're in a study through Hebrews, and we just finished chapter six at Res on Sundays. I should clarify that um, we just finished chapter six on Sunday, and a big part of the end of chapter five and all of chapter six, the author of Hebrews is addressing what he calls dullness of hearing Mm -hmm. or spiritual immaturity. Those two things seem to be synonymous and dullness of hearing and spiritually immature Christians seem to be, according to the author of Hebrews, people who are content with gospel basics, Mm -hmm. elementary things related to the gospels. He mentions repentance from dead works and instructions about washings, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. You know, you, you talk to the garden variety Christian today Yep. Uh, and ask them what's the gospel, they might say something to the effect of, well, Jesus Christ died for my sins so that I can go to heaven when I die. Mm-hmm. And as long as I got that much, then that's really all I need to know. The rest is just gravy. Mm-hmm. And it, it's no wonder to me that, you know, it, I, my, my wife and I were talking about this this morning as it relates to the solar eclipse and all the so-called prophetic words about that is Mm -hmm. how are people, how are Christians so stinking gullible? (laughs) Stop being weird. It it aggravates me. How are we so stinking gullible? Maybe it's because we have, we're spiritually immature, dull of hearing elementary school Christians who are still rehearsing over and over again, the ABCs of the gospel. And we have not familiarized ourselves, we have not availed ourselves to the treasure trove of God's inspired word mm-hmm. to, to where we could actually, with biblically solid roots and foundation, joyfully, excitedly expect the Spirit to work in a prophetic way among us. Yeah. Like, I- like, like, just, just, we just pause right there for a minute. Like, it, it, line up all the cessationist guys. Line them all up. You know, and, and let's just for a minute imagine the possibility that we could, again, with a solid biblical foundation, joyfully expect the Spirit to work through people in a prophetic way, make himself known in a prophetic way, insight into the mind and heart of God that perfectly lines up with this and is encouraged. Paul talks about prophecy being encouraging to the whole church. Mm -hmm. If that was actually possible, is there anybody, cessationist, continuationist alike, who wouldn't sign up for that if it was actually possible? Right, right. Who would not sign up for that? Right, yeah. 
all of all of our problems, uh, and I would say all of our problems in the country. Period. You are talking about political, spiritual, whatever, is because people don't know the Bible. They don't, and and our gullibility, and I, I say are in the royal sense. Our gullibility is because we don't know the Bible. It is sufficient, which is why we expect prophecies, true prophecies, to actually line up with what's found in that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but if you want to, if you want to cure all of the issues in the world, get to know that. Get to know that. And one of the things that I appreciate about a lot of my cessationist friends is that they they have studied the scriptures thoroughly. Uh, I say thoroughly. They they've they've studied them intentionally. Mm -hmm. And they are more than willing, and rightfully so, I think, to call out nonsense. Yeah, to call out things that are evil mm -hmm. in the that offered in the name of God, but yet are evil because they're not in line with the mind and heart of God. And that is one of my biggest criticisms of the Pentecostal charismatic world is that you know we're we're afraid. I say we; they are afraid to call nonsense nonsense because they're. They're afraid that that will uh, undermine their distinctive. Mm -hmm. And I, honestly, I think it would. Yeah, it would completely. It, it, and and our cessationist friends are unwilling to entertain the notion of the spirit working in these ways because I, I they they might try to make a biblical case, but I think you, the reason you are a squishy continuationist is because you realize there's not really a strong biblical case to be made here. Right. So. They're they're more scared of the abuses, and so therefore they throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. I just I just want to have everything that God promises us, right? And that's all I'm after. And and Paul seems to think that manifestations of the Spirit are not relegated to either the apostolic era or the apostles themselves. Mm -hmm. So, what are we going to do with that? Right. And and honestly, I think there's a lot of cessationists who actually do have the gift of prophecy and operate in that way. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. instance, almost for, in spite of their for theology instance, to uh, like John MacArthur's church during COVID when California said, no, you have to shut down. And MacArthur's like, no, God still wants us to meet. Yeah. And they still met and then they won the court case. Yeah. Right. You talk about having, having some kind of uh, prophetic gift and then that being confirmed. Mm. Boy, how do you, like that doesn't mean that every church would have won there. I know the Canadian stuff was even worse, but no, MacArthur was right in knowing God's mind and heart and wanting his people to meet in person. Yep. And so they kept doing it after, you know, they stopped for a while, but they said, no, God wants us to meet. I think that was prophetic. And, and I just think that, you know, John MacArthur could have more joy in that than he does. Right. Right, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's honestly how I feel about it. It's yeah. like, do, do I do I believe that MacArthur was led by the Spirit and his church was led by the Spirit? Sure, I do. Yeah, and I think MacArthur is, despite the fact that he and I would absolutely butt heads on spiritual gifts and other things, I think he's a faithful expositor of the Word. Yep, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, and I think honestly, the Spirit works through him in profound and beautiful ways. And I think he could have more joy in it. Yep. And I think his people could have more joy in it without becoming um, charismatics in the sense that, yep. you know, uh, or, or or the type of charismatic that he's been so critical of. Just like we think that uh, the Calvary Chapel folks would have more joy if they all became Calvinists. Yeah, because that's exactly right. You know, or everybody would become uh, more joyful if they all became post-mill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had to work. I hadn't worked that in in a while. So well, everybody take yeah, a shot. Yeah. <laughs> but, but no, you're right. There, I think let's just leave it at is just stop being dispensationalist and you okay, have more joy. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get you one day. We'll get you one day. Uh, but no, there's, there's more joy in being doctrinally sound because, totally. because that's what God is up to. No. And I think that's a, I mean, that's a really, you know, profound thing for us to consider. I mean, even when it comes to post mill, a mill, mm -hmm. pre mill, mm -hmm. is, wh whichever one of us is right is going to have more joy. Right. You know, it, whichever one is more biblically accurate, and we just, you know, th there's room for debate there. But right, I, th I think you know, I think there's actually, if if we could do away with the labels 
And if we could be more willing to call nonsense nonsense and say that doesn't look, sound, or smell like Jesus and his kingdom agenda, we could throw out the labels and just endeavor to be biblical people Mm. and actually have greater joy and experience greater fellowship uh, with Christ and with the Holy Spirit and be more familiar with. I mean, Jesus said, it's better that I go away because the Spirit's going to come. Right. I mean, come on. Let's like, what Paul says, don't quench the Spirit. Don't grieve the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Incline yourself to the person and work of the Spirit. And I know my cessationist friends would say, that's exactly what we're doing when we dive into God's Word and when we teach. And I would say yes and amen to all that. Um, But perhaps we've, you know, I've said this before, Brian Onkin says, you know, Satan doesn't print six and a half dollar counterfeit bills. Mm-hmm. You know, he, I, I think, I, I think in, not in all cases, not in all cases, but in some cases, the Pentecostal charismatic movement has, I think, been leveraged by Satan oh, yeah. to be a detriment to the evangelical church. Absolutely. Uh, to keep us limited, to keep us from being open and expectant with solid biblical roots. We can have both. We can be open. We can be expectant um, with a solid biblical foundation that that will keep us from wandering off into la-la land. Right, right. Uh, One quick point. Uh, I totally agree with everything you just said, even with the thing about the labels. Um, I find labels very helpful in order to have a shorthand. So I don't have to use 500 words to describe a position. Yep. Where they fall apart is when people don't know what they're talking about. Happens all the Uh, time. Like with um, a couple weeks ago, Ligon Duncan was on a podcast and started taking shots at theonomy and completely misrepresented it. Yep. Which being, being a theonomist and a post mill guy, everybody take a shot. Um, since that's the drinking game in the lounge, apparently. Everybody takes a shot whenever I mention that I'm post mill. <laughs> <laughs> so that's two for you. Yep. You should be feeling good. Uh, but he just started throwing bombs while misrepresenting the position. It's sad. And, and that's really, really sad when what we should be able to do is say, all right, I disagree with that position and here's why. Mm. Right? So whether it's the theonomy or R2K or continuationism, cessationism, Arminianism, Calvinism – represent the other side fairly. And I think we've done a pretty good job with that, with representing cessationists mm. and with the continuationists who have their definitions wrong. Yeah, and I, I think, think we've done a pretty good job of that. And I think if you're listening to this and you would call yourself a continuationist simply because you grew up in a church that was that way, um, you know, I, I think you need to, to pause yeah, and, and you need to consider what does it mean that I'm a continuationist? What does the Bible actually say? Yeah, I've been on that journey for twenty some years because I did grow up, and I, I the more I read my Bible, the more I realized my continuationist theology was based on sound bites from sermons, right? Not really what I knew and understood about the Scripture. On conversely, if you're a cessationist simply because you've watched all the clowns on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Then you you need to consider, yep. um, you know what what is the basis upon which you would say that all or some of the spiritual gifts listed in the New Testament have ceased? Right. That the Spirit said, "Okay, I'm only going to do this until 70 A.D. Mm-hmm. or whatever, or whatever." Yeah. Um, and then I'm done with that. Now you got the Bible, y'all figure it out. Like you, like you just need to right. Pause right there. Now, you you can obviously make a case. Well, you have to make the case that certain offices have ceased, right? The office of apostle. We don't have big A apostles anymore. No. Uh, we don't have the office. The New Testament doesn't have the office of prophet, right? We have deacons and elders. Yep. And that's it. Yeah. Um, C- capital P, capital A. Right. That doesn't mean that prophetic ministry has ceased sure. or that apostolic ministry in the sense that people are being sent. Right. To right. proclaim the gospel right. to people who have not yet heard. Yes. That so, that that is right. an important so, distinction. So if if that makes us a cessationist <laughs> in that sense, then sure. Right. Uh, but then that would also make a lot of people cessationists in that 
category, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's where these terms start to fall apart a little bit, I think. Yeah, I agree. Where I think the the better, and I'm still working on trying to come up with a term for it, I think the better uh, terminology would be, what can we expect God to do all the time on a regular basis, and then what does he surprise us with? Hmm. Well, it, it, anything that he surprises us with, anything that we're expecting him to do is never going to add to or contradict this. And that, you know, we just did this episode with, you know, Dr. Travis Kearns on Mormonism. Mm -hmm. This is one of the clear distinctions between true Christianity and the Mormon church is that nothing is being added to this. Right. That is not true of the Mormon church. And even with the Mormon church, God changes his mind on stuff. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know god doesn't change his mind yeah and, and, and there are some pentecostals and charismatics who will say that god changed his mind because you didn't xyz that's why this thing didn't come true and that's that's the clowns that we've been talking about yeah so good stuff good yeah. stuff reject the clowns study your bible yes that's it go love god love your neighbor makes music we'll see you next time <laughs> <laughs>